ladies and gentlemen, I should uh, uh, welcome you to this uh, uh, symposium on the future of police accountability. And I uh, begin by acknowledging the Aora people who are the, the traditional custodians of the land and pay respect to their elders past and present and I extend that respect to other Aboriginal people who are here present. I extend it to Adam Goods who's not present too. Um, uh, the, this forum is jointly hosted by the University of uh, New South Wales Law School and the Redfern Legal Centre. Uh, most of you would know that the Redfern Legal Centre runs a statewide police complaints practice. Uh, fewer of you will know that the university now provides sponsorship for uh, that uh, complaints practice at Redfern uh, in consequence of various government cuts to funding. And this is in fact the first official event of that new partnership. What I should do first perhaps is to introduce the panellists. Um, I'm not sure what order they're sitting in, uh, but I think it's Assistant Commissioner Peter Gallagher who's first in line there. He's commander of the New South Wales Police Force Professional Standards Command. He joined the force as a cadet in 1976. In the early 90s, he was seconded to the Independent Commission Against Corruption, where he worked as a senior investigator. He's been local area commander uh, all around the, uh, the state, and he's presently uh, completing a PhD involving the, the self-identification and motivation of police officers. Beside him, I can't see who's there. Beside him is David Shoebridge, the Greens uh, member of the Upper House since 2010. And in his time in Parliament, uh, David's responded to hundreds of complaints from the public and the police uh, about police misconduct and uh, the, the problems with current oversight of complaints. And uh, that experience obviously informs his opinions. Trevor Khan, no, the next person actually in, in line there is Dr. Vicky Sentas, who is Senior Lecturer in Criminal Law and Policing at the University of New South Wales Faculty of Law. She coordinates a student clinic on police complaints, assisting Redfern Legal Centre's police practice. And she's researched and published in the fields of counter-terrorism, police powers, criminal justice and minorities. Beside her is David Porter, uh, senior solicitor at the Redfern Legal Centre. The past five years, David's been responsible for the centre's work on police powers and freedom of information law. Redfern Legal Centre operates a statewide policing practice which represents both victims of crime and accused people in formal complaints against police. The Honourable Trevor Khan uh, was first elected to the Legislative Council this parliament in 2007 and is presently deputy president and chair of committees. He's chair of the Legislative Council's Privileges Committee and chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. And Trevor formerly practices as a lawyer in Tamworth, principally in the areas of criminal and family law. And therefore on the end is Alan Beckley. Alan Beckley is Adjunct Research Fellow at the School of Social Sciences and Psychology at the University of Western Sydney and Associate Investigator at the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence in Policing and Security. He served as a police officer for 30 years in the United Kingdom uh, where he published a great many articles uh, on uh, policing and while serving, he investigated several complaints against police under the supervision of the United Kingdom's Independent Police Complaints Commission. Uh, that's our panel. I should also say that uh, it's, um, well, I should now introduce Andrew Tink. Um, where is Andrew? Down here. Uh, Andrew Tink uh, began his working life as a barrister. He was elected to the New South Wales Parliament in 1988. 
In 2002, he became the inaugural chair of the Joint Parliamentary Committee over citing the Ombudsman's Office, and he led an inquiry into the handling of complaints against police. He was Shadow Minister for Police between 1996 and 2002, and he was Shadow Attorney General between 2002 and 2006. And in my personal opinion, he gave the Attorney General of the day far too much trouble. <laughs> In 2007, Andrew uh, stepped back from politics to concentrate on writing, and he since produced four books, including the one that I have read, a marvellous account of the life of William Charles Wentworth. He's now adjunct professor at Macquarie University Law School, president of the Library Council of New South Wales, and he's got a, an honorary doctorate of letters from Macquarie University. Now what Andrew has done is to agree to provide us with a, a quick introduction to the review of police accountability that he is now conducting uh, and uh, about which we are of course uh, to, to have discussion. I should make it clear uh, that Andrew uh, won't be answering questions from the audience at this time uh, obviously, it's not really appropriate for him to be debating the issues at hand before he's even completed his report. But uh, I have great pleasure in welcoming Andrew, I think up here, just to give you a brief introduction. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge any Indigenous Australians present, and I specifically would like to support Bob Delipas' uh, acknowledgement of Adam Goods. Um, I just need to explain before going any further that I've had radiation for throat cancer and I get a dry mouth. There's nothing else wrong with me except I've got to sit from this bottle. So if you wonder what I'm doing this for, that's the reason why. Um, on the 20th of May this year, um, I was commissioned by Letters Patent to um, review um, the uh, police oversight system in New South Wales. Uh, there were detailed terms of reference uh, in that commission and uh, they were advertised um, in the uh, Herald and the Telegraph on uh, Saturday the 23rd of May 2015. Uh, we uh, sought written submissions and have received a number and I might say a good range of submissions. And uh, one of those submissions came from one of the co-hosts of today's uh, function, the Redfin uh, Legal Centre. Um, all those submissions are up on the um, uh, uh, website, the Justice Department uh, website, so they're there for uh, people to see. And I thought then I'd just uh, spend a few moments uh, on the terms of reference themselves without sort of tortuously reading them out. By way of background, and I'm, I'm, I'm limiting myself to the terms of reference, in some ways I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about this. Normally, as Bob knows, he, he's already mentioned I caused him trouble when he was Attorney General. I take that as a compliment, but um, I'm not normally shy of uh, debates, but uh, in this instance, um, I've got a job to do. Um, I've got a report to make to the government. Um, uh, that, that's, that's what I'm authorised uh, and required to do indeed. And so that's why, as Bob um, has explained, um, I um, am here to listen, really, and uh, to be informed and to... Uh, uh, make copious notes. Um, we're at a stage in this inquiry where, um, uh, where, where we're starting to weigh all the issues. Uh, we've got voluminous amounts of information. Uh, one of the terms of reference requires me to uh, look at other models from around the world, uh, and we've looked at a large number. And uh, so the, the material that we've uh, to get through, including the submissions, including second reading debates of various bills that have come and gone, including parliamentary um, inquiry reports, um, that's the stage we're at, going through that material, forming views. And so this, for me personally, is a very timely uh, conference, a very timely debate, and um, uh, one which I'm, I'm confident um, will, will help to inform me. Well, 
in connection with the precise terms of reference, um, they, they're grounded in, in the proposition that uh, a number of reports have highlighted the overlapping nature of the police oversight system. Uh, and there are four specifically referred to. The McClelland Review of the System for Investigation and Oversight of Critical Incidents, which was released in January 2014. Uh, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Ombudsman, the Police Integrity Commission and the Crime Commission uh, from August 1914. Uh, a review back in 2011, a statutory view of the Police Integrity Commission Act. And most recently, a report in February 2015 from the Select Committee on Operation Prospect. So that's the immediate sequencing of the background leading to these terms of reference being issued. Um, in terms of what I'm consi to consider, there are a number of things, but I'll summarise them this way. Uh, looking for options for a single civilian uh, oversight model for police, uh, to look at any gaps in the current system of police oversight, to look at functional overlap between existing bodies, uh, to look at models from around the world, and uh, including in particular, there's a specific reference here to the UK Independent Police Complaints Commission, and to um, uh, weigh up their applicability and adaptability to New South Wales, and then um, a recommended model for police oversight to take into account um, a, a number of matters which uh, I won't read out, um, and also whether there's then an issue arising about oversight for the New South Wales Crime Commission. Um, just to say briefly uh, that um, uh, we, we have uh, looked at a, a number of overseas models and we're focusing on a few, a number of which have um, uh, figured prominently in a number of the submissions made to the inquiry. Uh, one of those um, is of course the um, Independent Police Complaints Commission. Uh, it says UK, my understanding of it's in fact England and Wales. Um, and. Uh, I've uh, been to see Deborah Glass, who's currently the Ombudsman in Victoria, but who was uh, relevantly previously the Deputy Chair of the Independent Police Complaints Commission in, um, in, uh, in England. Um, the uh, Office of uh, the Police Ombudsman for Northern Ireland, um, uh, that, that's another one which is featured prominently in submissions we're having a good look at. And also um, the third uh, is um, the Independent Police Conduct Authority uh, from New Zealand, and uh, I had a lengthy uh, um, video conference with the, the chair of that authority, Sir David Carruthers, a few weeks ago. Um, but to mention those three in particular is not to sort of um, uh, say that others have been dismissed. Uh, they have not. So all those uh, issues are still in the mix. So uh, that's where I'm up to. Um, I have a reporting date um, of the 31st of August, uh, which is just a month away, and uh, I certainly intend to keep it, uh, so much so that um, uh, I've arranged for a uh, presentation to the Governor on that day. Um, I've been asked to nominate my preference of beverage. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps I shouldn't say this, but I, anyway, I nominated peppermint tea. Uh, but but uh, I'm trying to make a serious point, which is that um, we're very firmly focused on uh, this review, uh, you know, in the context of, of, of meeting the deadline. So look, um, w w with those sort of comments, um, I'd like to thank the organisers particularly for um, uh, organising and hosting this forum and I expect to uh, learn a great deal and be better informed about um, the, the issues that I'm already um, uh, working on, on balancing up. Thanks very much. Okay, well look, uh, we'll go straight into it. Um, I'd like to ask the panel uh, and perhaps, uh, well, I don't know, uh, perhaps it's best to start it at, at, at the end closest to me and ask uh, Assistant Commissioner Gallagher to begin the answers. But uh, I wonder, could the panel talk to us about the nature of contemporary misconduct in the police service of New South Wales? I believe it's, it's not the same as it was 15 and 20 years ago. I'd agree with that. I think um, it's my 40th year in the job and I think um, the nature of police misconduct has changed significantly over time. 
Some of the challenges we're facing at the moment are arising from the use of social media, for example, something which we've, we've never even looked at 10 years ago. Uh, the ability for information to be shared very quickly amongst our officers and our officers' friends, and that information, which really should have remained quite confidential, um, it's a real challenge for us. Um, the officers live in the area of social media and quite often see nothing wrong with what they're doing. The other thing, of course, we, we are seeing a we are seeing and taking a much harsher approach in relation to the abuse of drugs and alcohol within the organisation. Now, whether that was it was the problem was at a similar level some years ago. Uh, I'm not sure. I think maybe we've just got better testing and uh, uh, detection methods now. Bribery, um, you know, fixing court cases, all those sorts of things that you know, the, the Royal Commission looked at some time ago. We don't see so much of that anymore. Um, so it is really our, our problems are changing with the contemporary nature of, of society. <laughs> I know the Royal Commission actually observed that fabricating evidence was often the beginning of a, uh, a corrupt career. But, uh, David, your answer to that question. Well, I, I agree largely with Peter. I think we're not seeing all the chook foulers um, that, that we used to see. It, it's a different form of, of corruption. In, in many ways, the, the biggest issue is dealing with reforming parts of the culture, how discretionary powers are used how the consorting provisions may be used or, or abused, how the move-on powers are used or abused. I still think there are issues in terms of remarkable uniformity in terms of police evidence, uh, particularly in the local court, um, that needs to be reviewed, how it is that statements bear such remarkable similarity to themselves. Um, uh, but it's not the sort of overt bribery that was seen in the Wood Royal Commission. Um, I think we also need to look at the way that the police investigations themselves produce an unhealthy culture. Um, there still is very much a, a um, either a conspiracy of silence or a or a or a protective nature in the way that internal police investigations of themselves um, are, uh, are undertaken. We look at something like the Adam Salter ca case, where we saw the critical incident investigation itself. I think, on, on one view, become part of a, a sort of corrupting process. But it's more subtle. It's not going to be caught in these amazing um, film clips that get shown on our nightly news. And it's changing that endemic culture, which is actually a, a bigger challenge, I think. Vicky. Just to pick up on that last comment about what's visible and what's invisible when we talk about police misconduct, and David mentioned the discretionary use of police powers. And what's clear from the experience of advocates like Redfern Legal Centre, Legal Aid, Youth Shopfront and others, it's the systemic over-policing of the most marginalised people, young people, people with mental illnesses. And I would go so far to say as the most pressing issue of police um, unaccountability uh, in the exercise of police powers relates to Indigenous peoples. And that's, you know, in terms of you know, the key recommendations around um, the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, around arrest being used as a last resort, is an exemplar. But also things like, you know, prejudicial kind of views around what constitutes whether someone is a suspect or not. Um, so these, you know, as David mentioned, kind of the uh, inappropriate use <coughs> of stop and search, move on. Um, you know, I know that um, David Porter will have more to say about this, but these are the kind of the, about the conditions of policing. And this was one of the concerns of the Wood Royal Commission. It wasn't simply when they looked at process corruption, it wasn't simply you know, bribery, you know, organised crime. It was looking at the socio-economic, political conditions around the kind of policing that we have and the emphasis on crime fighting at all costs. And I would say that that's worse today than it was back then. So the shift from reactive policing, traditionally a crime happens, you investigate it, you look at the, the suspects, has now moved to proactive policing and there's an organisational imperative 
to do high visibility, um, you know, targeted interference with the usual suspects. And unfortunately, the usual suspects end up being those who are frequently over-policed. And that's, that's the invisible area. Uh, David. Seizing on some of the, the comments that have been made already, I think one way to describe the contemporary nature of misconduct, which is not to say conduct, because there is good conduct, but the misconduct I think arises from, most concerningly, the ways in which the attempts to professionalise the police force entrench misconduct, the ways in which what is currently being, what in, the ways in which the concept of police work is evolving and uh, creating conditions for misconduct. And that's what we mean when we talk about the misuse and abuse of fundamental policing powers and policing concepts like suspicion, arrest, uh, the charges which are brought, the, the, the ways in which officers might persist with a charge when it should be dropped. That these, this sort of, what's been referred to as white knight, uh, corruption or misconduct, the ends justifying the means. And so there, there's, I know that there is, to a degree, um, internal disquiet within the police force about steps that can be taken, steps that are taken in individual cases which are not justified, which are not lawful, and which are not good police work either. But more broadly speaking, there is, a, I think there's a very real concern that the police notion of what good police work is, is drifting further away from the public's. And that's what we see played out in pieces of video evidence which are put on the news, that something which might pass muster internally provokes a very shocked reaction from the public. So it's not necessarily the, the brown paper bag association with the criminal element, misconduct and corruption. It is a situation where <coughs> the public and the police force are talking about increasingly two different things when they talk about misconduct and what an appropriate um, approach to police work is. Trevor Khan. I think, uh, in a sense, picking up, I, I think in terms of the general community, the question is more a matter of perception. Um, the, the nature of, of uh, the available media now creates, in many people, Picking up David's point, a concern uh, uh, sometimes with the excessive use of force. Uh, we saw that in 2013 uh, at Mardi Gras, uh, and we've seen it in other circumstances. Well, the Curdie case is another another example, and and uh, the the concern is magnified uh, by what I think will be a theme here from time to time in the delay in matters being resolved uh, in. Uh, the available evidence uh, taking a long time to become all available evidence uh, taking a long time to become available. I have to say that, you know, it's many years since I practiced, but afterward you did see a significant change in the police force. A lot of it for the good, uh, but you saw a lot of experienced officers drop out for a whole variety of reasons and a lot of young, uh, relatively inexperienced officers take over and, for instance, this issue of overcharging and persistence with charges long after uh, you would think they should have been abandoned it seemed to become uh, a quite common theme in the courts. Uh, nobody was prepared to make a decision. Things were allowed to drag on for excessive periods of time. Uh, the, the prosecutors wouldn't withdraw either. So that, uh, so that people suffered, in many cases, a quite abusive um, experience in the courts where matters should have been pleaded out a long time and, and matters matters resolved. So, so I, you know, to me, a lot of it is a matter of perception and uh, it's a matter of a loss of confidence arising from uh, from a failure to resolve matters quickly and efficiently. Uh, Alan Beckley, you you bring to us a... Uh... He, was making in, uh, he was talking about perceptions, but actually... Um, the, the sort of um, trait, the, um, the kite mark for a good system is whether the public have trust and confidence in their police. And i um, just like to say that um, a recent briefing paper by, um, in New South Wales, um, 
found that there was only one survey uh, about confidence in the police, um, that was one that I was involved in myself. Um, that was um, that found um, not only um, that there was low confidence, um, but also um, it uh, highlighted a lack of independence in, in investigation of complaints against police. Um, but also, it, it did a risk assessment of the, com the complaints that were um, listed and found that they were a significant risk to the reputation of the, of the New South Wales Police Force. And so, um, something needs to be done around that, except uh, what no one has said previously is the culture and um, the integrity of the police needs to be... Um, assessed in the whole of the culture in the state and um, uh, at the moment we're going through quite a lot of um, disruption um, in other areas of public life such as being looked at by um, ICAC for example. Um, I've worked in, um, in police forces in uh, Europe, um, not just the UK but uh, South Europe, Eastern Europe <coughs> And there is that problem. If there is um, a culture of corruption in a country, it's going to be reflected in the police service. So, you know, there are wider issues to be looked at. Okay. So, I suppose this leads to a, a, another question, which is just how <coughs> relevant are the the findings and observations of the Wood Royal Commission now. Uh, those of us who were around when the Wood Royal Commission reported were traumatised by it in various ways uh, to discover the extent of the high level of corruption that w was then exposed and to discover the, that uh, investigations by you know, the uh, internal affairs uh, unit of the police force were utterly ineffectual. But beyond that, Wood found that uh, the, the system of complaint was woefully, that was its words, woefully dilatory, uh, that it was focused on punishment, uh, that it was unnecessarily complex, um, and changes were introduced in consequence. Uh, I wonder if people on the panel could reflect on the, on the, on the relevance today of the, the Wood Royal Commission, and I, I've got no choice but to sort of count you off in this order again, sorry, uh, Assistant Commissioner. I think the uh, lessons from the Wood Royal Commission shouldn't be quickly abandoned, and I think therefore the, the role of the oversight agencies uh, that exist today should not be too quickly discounted. I think they're just as relevant today as they were following the years immediately after the Wood Royal Commission. Having said that, I do think the culture of the organisation has changed somewhat. Um, so Helen, I appreciate what you're saying, but in the National Survey of Community Satisfaction with Policing, we, we, we came up with a 90% confidence in the police in New South Wales, and with an 89% satisfaction in those that come into contact with police officers in New South Wales. And I think of the complaints that were referred to the Ombudsman, 32% of them were actually generated internally. I think that's a big change from the pre um, Wood Royal Commission days. Now, on one, on one hand, you might say, hang on, 32% of your police make complaints, you've got a major problem, but that's not the situation. What are these 32% of uh, the complaints are people willing to stand up and have a, have a say? And that, that's really important. Um, it is true that the, the kind of code of silence that existed before Wood was a fundamental element of the. Of the uh, the, the corrupt culture that existed. Yeah. I think the, um, just speaking in relation to uh, prosecutions, I think the, um, the separation between ourselves and the DPP is really, really important. The DPP provides a, an independent review as well in relation to the work we do. Um, the, I can't stress enough though, the, the importance of oversight, the ability of an independent agency to conduct a an investigation of the New South Wales Police Force and the, the ability of an independent agency to look at what we do is no less relevant today than it was after the Royal Commission. Um, but what I think the, I mean, the, the essential findings of, of, 
of the Woodrow Commission that you need independent oversight of police are as true today as they were then. But I think we've now road tested the structure that was set up following the Woodrow Commission for the better part of 20 years and it's not working. The Woodrow Commission's idea was to come up with a structure that would have a quick, timely, effective response to police complaints. And the idea was that in large part the Ombudsman's paper oversight and sometimes slightly more than that oversight of internal police uh, complaint uh, handling would assist in that. Well, well, I think it probably hasn't. And in fact, the multiplicity of agencies that were seen as a good idea at the time of the Wood Royal Commission of dividing, if you like, the very serious, rugged, I'll describe again this Chuck Fowler kind of corruption, which is dealt with by the Police Integrity Commission, and the sort of lesser forms of corruption and misconduct dealt with by the Ombudsman, um, hasn't really worked in practice. When you get a when you get a critical incident that might be seen to have newsworthiness, well then you sometimes find a, a fight between the agencies about who takes it on. But the more entrenched issues, those issues we've been talking about here, about the misuse of police powers, the um, potential misuse of uh, excessive force, that kind of entrenched corruption doesn't really have any anyone leading the, leading the charge on it. And, and I think that's what's missing. Um, so, you know, if you like the sexy large issues, there's a fight between the agencies about who gets to cover it. But the real bread and butter issues, well, I think they're not being addressed in the current police complaint system. You agree with that, Vicky? Yes, to an extent. I mean, I disagree. I don't think the problem is necessary to start by looking at the structure and the form of the accountability <coughs> bodies. I agree that we need to look at the principles and whether they fit the purpose now. What struck, things struck me as quite interesting when I was reading through some of the reviews, uh, submissions to the current review, and one was, I've got in front of me a really interesting quote from the Police Integrity Commission, basically saying, there's a continuing risk of serious police misconduct in New South Wales. It cannot be eliminated. And historically, in the absence of effective external mechanisms to deal with it, has may undergo resurgence. So that's directly from the Police Integrity Commission. Now, going back to the Wood Royal Commission, one of the kind of princ key principles that you keep hearing in the reviews today is this kind of mantra, this sacred cow, that police ultimately have to be responsible for investigating their own conduct as a way, and that was one of the key outcomes, principles of the Wood Royal Commission. And Wood himself sort of, you know, made very clear that there were inherent risks. There's an inherent conflict of interest. But the response of the Wood Royal Commission was to create a system which managed that risk. And I agree with David that that management of that risk um, is not working kind of in the present. So the other principle from the Wood Royal Commission, you know, from, you know and, and the reason why we have to um, look, you know, with quite cold eyes at the principle that police investigate themselves being an inherent conflict that can just be managed, um, is that it was responding to it as a different kind of issue, is that there wasn't a, um, a, a professionalised managerialism. I mean, there is now, clearly there are still problems. But there are other drivers for reform other than managerialism, and that's you know, pointing to some of the issues that we've been talking about, around kind of the issues around um, over-policing the usual suspects. That isn't going to be solved simply by managerialism. And certainly, I mean, the other aspect of the Wood Royal Commission was around developing a learning culture, not a blaming culture. Um, what we're seeing today, I think it's sort of gone the other way. I mean, there's, there's two big gaps there. There's an adherence to the idea of systemic, addressing systemic issues. I'm not sure where at the current system is actually um, adequately dealing with some of the systemic problems. And the other thing is that, you know, um, de the deterrent effect um, relies on police being, I guess, punished or disciplined um, for, um, for misconduct. Um, and the two need to go side by side in terms of deterrence and systemic. David, this is, uh, this is a really knotty intellectual problem, isn't it? it, it people are saying, uh, credibly, persuasively, that there are many reasons to suggest that police should, in fact, have responsibility for, uh, at least part of the responsibility for fixing their culture. And there are other persuasive arguments saying that uh, unless, you have, unless you have strong outside supervision, it won't occur. 
and the, the question is somehow or other to to uh, uh, amalgamate these approaches to, to produce a, uh, a virtuous result. Yes, and like most thorny questions, you can have two wholly uh, different perspectives which are both substantially true. And I think one of the the key considerations for for Redfern in the, the positions we've taken is what's actually going to get funded. Um, I mean, it, it really does matter to the substantive suggestions that you make. It mattered in the Wood Royal Commission. Um, they had to hand down recommendations for a system, and, and they had, or they almost had a blank check at that stage, given the findings of corruption at that point. <coughs> but there were still realities that needed to be dealt with. Um, we simply are in a situation where I think logistically police will be given some responsibility for investigating the level of complaints. Speak to somebody who is saying all police complaints should be independently investigated and ask them about you know, minor... Once you start looking at what's the allegedly minor end of the spectrum and they'll say, oh, well, you could probably have that investigated by someone from the local area command or the regional command. Um, that we're, we're in a situation, I think, now where you do, I think you do need some police involvement for the sheer efficiency of figuring out who's on board and who's not. Um, if the, it comes down to this notion of defining what is good police work in New South Wales at this time. Because if somebody's not pulling in that direction, then we probably do want to let them go. It, this, this isn't the right gig for them. If you do also fundamentally need the external oversight, it's, I think it's uncontroversial. It's certainly agreed by the police force in their submission to the, the current review that police have extraordinary powers which, requ which require an extraordinary level of oversight. The major issue, I think, is the quality of the oversight given the specific nature of police misconduct. And this was, uh, this is, I think, the primary, primarily relevant finding of the Royal Commission was that police misconduct is of a different nature to other public mis other misconduct of public officials. And the police association would have you believe that we should hand oversight over to ICAC. Um, that's a really bad idea, uh, and the I think the that was a finding of the Wood Royal Commission. It remains relevant now. Um, I would I think it be in subs in substance agreeing with the, the comments of the other um, speakers that that we've road tested the model. There are problems there, but I am. I'm not in favour of wholesale um, reconstruction of the structure. I think we can we can consolidate it, we can make things better, but largely the issue is a cultural one, not just with the police force, but also with some of the oversight bodies. When we talk about things like uh, turf wars in critical incidents, I don't. I'm not so fascinated with the turf wars about the critical incidents. Same thing happens with the legal profession. When somebody dies, there are plenty of legal practitioners who want to be involved in that case for entirely sympathetic and legitimate reasons, but that person doesn't need to worry about getting a lawyer. Where we need to worry about people getting advocacy and oversight is with the everyday prosecutions and situations where you still might have perjury. And that's what I think has been lost in the recent reviews and especially the focus on critical incidents. Sorry, okay. I know I went over time there. Liz is unfortunately quite out of my eye line. Come down here. No, it's it's okay. That's uh, it's clearly it's clearly a uh, a most uh, uh, significant uh, perspective that you've brought, uh, Trevor Cunn. Uh, well, we'll deal with what I'll make a disclosure. I I uh, had various tasks assigned to me by the uh, legal representation office on behalf of officers who appeared before Wood. And I have to say, to simply talk about Chuck Fowler in the context of, of uh, the Royal Commission is to misunderstand uh, 
uh, what that inquiry was about. Like, what, what would uh, essentially identified was <coughs> that people ended up um, in very serious and systemic corruption uh, not by suddenly walking into a police station one day and deciding, hey, I'll take a sling from a major drug dealer and I'll then become part of the exercise. It started off in very, very small, very, very discreet matters, uh, whether it be uh, overlooking the commission of an offence, losing bits of evidence, all very minor stuff, uh, which built upon itself, either because you were with other officers engaged in that conduct, because you were influenced by other, uh, other, other officers. And, and I think what Wood really demonstrated was the capacity for an organisation to essentially lose its ethical base and for officers to lose um, their ethical compass over a period of time. And, uh, you know, I was looking at something recently uh, in, in trying to put this into some sort of context and why Wood remains uh, a, a constant theme that we should return to, and that was, for us who are old enough to remember, it was the famous Stanford prison experiment, where, uh, where good people selected off the street, divided into two categories, uh, and uh, one turned into prison officers, the other turned into prisoners, and over a period of time, within six days, you've got normal people off the street abusing uh, the so-called prisoners, and the prisoners are accepting it, you know, being compliant in the exercise. That's a, an, a, an organisational impact on, on people's behaviour that has nothing to do with people's individual individual moral compass. So uh, how does that apply here? A, a police force can go off the rails if it doesn't have appropriate oversight bodies, uh, uh, appropriate capacity to, to govern itself. Uh, and that's the lesson of Wood. It's, it's not chook foul. It's, it's something more thoroughly basic than that that, uh, that you've got to have. And, but I've got to say this in terms of it also. You can't, you can't talk about um, things, uh, things like happen every day in the police force and simply call a lot of it corrupt. A lot of it is poor training. A lot of it is stupidity. It actually doesn't fall within a category that's easily identified as corrupt. And you see it with ICAC now. You know, there's got to be a line that's drawn where you say, well, actually, we're, we're going to actually deal with systemic, serious and systemic corruption. And then we're going to deal with the oath uh, who mischarges or overcharges and the like. And all of those, that whole spectrum of behaviour from grossly corrupt to stupidity has to be dealt with in some way uh, in terms of uh, uh, the training of, of officers, the disciplining of officers, the prosecution of officers where they've committed a, a criminal offence, but you just can't junk it in together and say it all needs the same, uh, the same model uh, to deal with. Because if you do, you are going to overload the body that is dealing with the, with the serious and systemic stuff and potentially just grind everything to a halt. And I think people have to be careful. Okay. I, can I just say one final thing? The final <laughs> thing is there are problems with our oversight body now, or our oversight bodies now, but it's not necessarily in terms of the design of the body. And if you look at some of those, uh, some of the, uh, uh, some of the submissions made, and look, Paris had thought that I'd say this, but go and look at what the Ombudsman says. Uh, with regards to certain lack of powers. And I know we're not only talking about critical incidents, but it's the timeliness of the oversight of that. You know, like, do you oversight a critical incident after it's all done and dusted? Is the first oversight of a critical incident when, if it's a death, when, uh, when a coroner looks at it? No, there's got to be a timeliness so that an Adam Salter matter isn't allowed to, to occur. That, that requires some immediacy of oversight. Now, that doesn't really exist. Trevor, we'll, we'll come back to you. Sure. <laughs> um, Alan, the, we're just getting people to respond to, the, to the, uh, the question of the relevance, the continuing relevance of the Wood Royal Commission. Um, yeah, thanks for that. The, um, my response to that is there are still some very relevant points in Wood. Um, however, um, if I were to um, look at the, the problem in front of us, I would actually be looking at uh, to try to establish what is the function and purpose of the independent oversight body that we're seeking to create 
Um, for example, um, if, you, if you're holding up the Independent Police Complaints Commission in England and Wales um, as um, a model, actually that was put into place to answer a specific legal question over whether um, the England and Wales had a sufficiently independent body to investigate deaths in police custody. And that was the sole purpose of it. And so, um, the, as I say, you need to look at what, what, um, what the body is set up to do in the first instance. Um, and as to the responsibility of police for their own misconduct, I think if you totally outsource um, investigations into the police, police misconduct, then it's possible that um, the, the police will take less responsibility for their own actions. So be careful, you know, if, you, if you're talking about um, totally independent investigations, for example. Um, <clears throat> uh, various things have been tried uh, to, to try to um, make the investigations more independent. For example, uh, with the uh, Police Integrity Commission, they're not allowed to, uh, to appoint investigators um, who served in the, in the New South Wales Police Force. <coughs> um, in Northern Ireland, um, they were trying to actually um, uh, appoint um, investigators who, who were from other organisations other than the police service. But they actually failed to do that totally, because you'll find that there are um, ex-police officers in the investigators. So, um, and the, other, the only other thing I would say is, we do need to build on this uh, aspect of learning opportunities, not only with complaints against police, <clears throat> but also with critical incidents. We need the police to learn from um, their behaviour and their mistakes, and try not to do the same thing again in the future. Well, I'll ask a question now which I suppose overlaps with some of the things that some of you have been saying, but can I ask the panel to, to, to nominate what they think are at present the most significant uh, roadblocks or problems with the, uh, uh, the, the complaint system? I'll start again, start again with, with you, Peter Gallagher. I, I'm, I'm happy to jump in if you to throw myself under the bus. If, <laughs> by, by all means, by all means. <coughs> Well, I think the, the thing that Redfern's found through five years of attempting to be an advocate in these particular situations, the biggest... The, the, you've got two questions, uh, two subsets within that. One is what's the biggest roadblock to the use of the system? What's the, and then secondly, what's the biggest roadblock to the effectiveness of the system? In terms of use, it's that there is no advocate, except when, except when a, a lawyer puts their hand up and says, I'm going to learn about the Police Act, I'm going to make this formal complaint for somebody, I'm going to articulate the issues, I'm going to try and clearly define what the complaint is about, what misconduct has occurred. Unless somebody's willing to do that, it's very, very hard. The, uh, the Ombudsman will tell you what you can do, but not what you should do. It's not their role to be an advocate. It's their role to, to oversight. In terms of, so I think, room for advocates, and, and um, facility of those advocates with the system is a problem for, is the, the roadblock for the use of the system. In terms of effectiveness, the commissioner has an unfettered disciplinary power and nobody else can touch it. Okay, they, none of the oversight bodies have the ability to implement a disciplinary power against an employee and there are, very numbers, there are a sound number of legal reasons for that, but what it means is that those oversight bodies are effectively toothless. One thing that we would recommend is that in the most extreme cases, the most serious cases of misconduct, that the oversight body should have access to the same power to dismiss an officer as the commissioner has. That power is subject to review. It's not none. It wouldn't be an unfettered power by the oversight body, but what it would mean is that the most serious cases this, there is that it is not solely within the commissioner's hands because the commissioner doesn't have to listen to anybody else in terms of discipline at the moment and that lessens the coercive effect of the complaint system. I think some of the challenges at the moment are clear definitions of roles uh, 
between the agencies. Um, you know, just I'll give, I'll give an example is the question as to whether or not the ombudsman should have oversight of big leads. Uh, I've got a personal view that there's a burning issue in relation to that. That's something that should be resolved. Should they have oversight of the critical incident? See, normally when a critical incident, especially a criti critical incident involving a death occurs, we suspend Part 8A in order that the coroner can conduct an investigation. Once we suspend Part 8A, which is our complaint section under the Act, then the Ombudsman's got no role. So that, things like that really need to be sorted out. Look, I do agree advocacy is a gap. Advocacy is a gap in relation to um, <coughs> the police complaint system. Um, certainly, it, it, would, it would be a benefit on occasions for us to see um, much more representation of complaints on occasion. I think that's a really it, Including to, <coughs> of the uh, predominantly poor and disadvantaged people who are most affected by uh, improper practice. I think so. I think that um, that would just be part of a, uh, you know, a modern police force being held accountable. I don't see any problem with that at all. The, in relation to, if I just speak in relation to the Ombudsman um, in the first instance, the Ombudsman holds a, a burner to us in a hundred different ways. Um, sometimes it's not seen, but they hold us to account constantly in relation to what we do. They're involved in every single aspect of what we're doing in the complaints management system. But sometimes it's an absolute pain because they're so, uh, so involved, but it's absolutely necessary. In relation to um, the prosecution, the uh, commission having unfettered powers to discipline officers, um, we're not quite correct. We are very distinctly limited by precedent. <coughs> for, for example, we don't dismiss officers, we remove them under a specific section of the Act. They've got a right of appeal to the Industrial Relations Commission <coughs> on the basis that the removal was harsh, unreasonable, or unjust, or beyond power. Now, what happens at the Industrial Relations Commission, they don't judge the decision of the Commissioner. They have, hear they have a hearing de novo and make their own determination as to whether or not the officer should be removed. So the Commissioner's powers are fettered to quite a large degree in relation to those sorts of things. Where we seek to take, where a commander, such as myself, seeks to take reviewable action against an officer to disciplinary transfer them or to demote them, once again, uh, my powers are fettered by the Industrial Relations Commission. They can review uh, what I do and overturn what I do. So we are very, very much fettered. I'm not saying um, negatively. Um, in the main, I think that the Industrial Relations Commission tries to support the organisation. Um, but to say that it's unfair that is probably not quite correct. Okay, thanks David. Um, well I think from both the public's percep perception and from the police perception, it's not a fair process. So you often, I have uh, many, 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 many uh, complaints that I get about the current police complaint system come from police themselves who feel like they're caught in a deeply unfair process that never ends. And they can do the merry-go-round. They can have an internal affairs investigation, they can have an ombudsman's investigation, they can have a PIC investigation, then they can find themselves before the, before the local court. And, um, you know, as a, as a barrister, I find that the lack of procedural fairness that police have in that process is quite extraordinary, and I understand their grievances with it. And, and, and when I first started looking at the police oversight mechanism, I found it astounding that the police integrity <coughs> commission's inspectors' reports and recommendations were not only unenforceable, but weren't even being put up on the Police Integrity Commission's website when he had a critique about the way the Police Integrity Commission operated. And, and that produced a, a very strong break <coughs> between the people in the police and the Police Integrity Commission. A sense, a sense that the, the Integrity Commission wasn't going to provide them with procedural fairness. When you look at it from the ordinary member of the public's point of view, we talk about one of the key failings with police and one of the key corruption issues with police is, is the use of police powers with marginal groups. If you tell a, a young Aboriginal man in Burke that if you want to make a complaint about the police, you need to trot down to the local police station and start the complaint there, well, you know what's going to happen. They're not going to make the complaint. And, and, and I think the public don't, don't believe, and I think they're right not to believe, that in a system where essentially it's police investigating police, that you're going to get a result at the end of the day. And instead, what we have, we have 
sometimes a never-ending paper war, which involves the Ombudsman and internal affairs. It can take months. Complaints are, are, are reiterated time and time again because the complainant doesn't feel like they get a just result. The police officer is in court, caught in this paper war and their career can be on hold for a while. Nobody's getting a good outcome with the current system. That's why we need an external body to go to, to lodge the complaint, to triage the complaint um, as a starting point. For, a, uh, for an independent complaint system. Okay. Now, I'm getting a bit worried about the time because we've promised we'll give the audience some, some question time. But Vicky, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, just, just briefly. The current system is structured to disempower complainants, and that absolutely needs to be addressed. There need to be reasons for any decisions, like at the moment, if the police uh, decide that a complaint is not sustained, you just get a letter saying that without reasons. That's incredibly disempowering. Um, you know, one of the red lines in this whole issue that you know even the um, the ombudsman and the police integrity commission say there's a glaring gap is around um, the investigation of critical incidents. So that's like I think a really kind of obvious, clear one when we're talking around. The social conditions, um, you know, the, I think Alan rightly sort of pointed to the fact that we can't just take on kind of models from overseas before we look at what the glaring problems here. Um, the um, police investigation of themselves around police-related deaths is a, a glaring problem that needs um, to be addressed right now. Um, and I'll send it there. So there are, there are some structural problems and there are the problems that are associated with police culture uh, and indeed with management culture. Uh, there's nothing surprising about that. It's what always happens. But uh, David, you kind of had a go, but you, you want another half a minute? I, 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 well, the, the only thing uh, that I will say is I should have spoken more specifically about the Commissioner's disciplinary power. The Commissioner can't be compelled to take action against an officer. Quite rightly, where reviewable or removal action is taken against an officer, that officer can complain about it and ask that it be reviewed by the Industrial Relations Commission, but nobody can force the Commissioner to take disciplinary action, and that is where you get uh, a tolerance of behaviour that should be punished. Okay. Trevor? Well, look, I, I would have thought uh, in any system that the it may not be a roadblock, but the fundamental criteria has to be timeliness. Uh, and whether it's a serious matter or, or whether it's a minor matter, um, the, the faith in the system is destroyed by taking as long as it does now. Mm. People give up. That's so for the police and for the complaint? A absolutely. Mm. Alan? Oh, okay. Um, I've got six points, but I'll, I'll only talk about a couple of them. Uh, the six points are cracks that the cases fall into or fall through, overlaps in investigations, for example, um, the Ombudsman, the PIC and the coroner are all investigating the same particular incident, um, confusion with clients as to who to go to to complain, um, effective oversight, uh, um, so we need to get a good balance on that between capture of the oversight agency towards um, uh, bias um, in terms of, um, if you like, a, a, an example might be the, uh, the prospect um, investigation at the moment. Um, and also we need um, certainty, cohesion and coordination. Um, and some of these problems might be answered by a mandatory referral system. So if an incident happens within a definition, this, is, this happens in the English system, it's automatically referred to the oversight um, body. And, um, and then the oversight body decides what action to take, whether they're going to investigate in personally, the, the, the independent oversight body, or whether they'll refer it to the police to investigate. Um, but the, the final point I'd like to make is, um, I think, we need to be very careful about officer protection. Um, some, some aspects have already been mentioned, but though, uh, there are also other aspects such as um, whistleblower protection and the ability of individual police officers to actually get their complaint heard and, and resolved. Um, and uh, we've got various examples of that um, falling foul of the system. 
Here's a here's a final question before we pass it across to the audience. Would people prepared to nominate the smallest change uh, that would make a very big difference? I think that um, in relation to whenever we look at the either the police internal system or we're dealing with complaints or the police oversight system in dealing with complaints. I think the smallest change we need to make is for each of us to be aware who are involved in dealing with matters that sometimes we, our, our view can be skewed because we're only dealing with the bad news stories. I think what we need to do constantly is to remind ourselves to look at the big picture. The big, and the big picture is this, that it still is only a relatively small number of police officers that become involved in um, corrupt conduct. I totally agree with what said before, is most of it just needs to be corrected at the local level. Um, and I think that we should not rise to ca individual cases. We should <coughs> change the whole system because of individual cases unless the evidence is overwhelming. So that's the change I'd like to say. Let's look at the big picture instead of just, and look at the evidence. <coughs> Rather than just individual this is these are to be very short answers, David. Well, I mean, the, the shortest answer would just be reasons. People being given reasons for why steps are taken or not taken. Vicky. Another short answer: um, the oversight body could do the initial triage and make the decision about the appropriate balance between um, police investigation or. How disciplined you're all being, Dave. <laughs> uh, in terms of the current system, there is a problem with the way or the reasons given for declining a complaint. Uh, I think the biggest change would be quite often somebody has a criminal prosecution on foot against them, uh, which may be, uh, could range from minor misconduct to extremely serious misconduct to do with that prosecution. If they make a complaint at that point, it is commonly, not universally, but almost, but the standard practice is to decline that because there's what's called an alternative and satisfactory uh, means of redress available to them, which is that they're supposed to raise all their complaint issues in front of the local court magistrate. That's not alternative, it's not satisfactory, it's not even a means of redress. That should be removed as a reason to decline a complaint. Trevor. Smallest change, real-time, independent oversight of critical incidents. And that leaves us with Alan. Yeah, um, I, I would just um, add to what other people have said around the smallest thing would be communication. Um, actual information about the systems, that as it is, um, in everyday language, information uh, around various public buildings, including police stations, and also keeping people advised of the progress of their complaint if they've made a complaint. 